Simon Wilson and Matt Biddos. Uh, thank you, James. <laughs> so yeah, um, this being a developer conference, I thought it would be a good idea to sort of close the day with something quite developer focused. I wanted to talk about technology stacks. And in particular, I wanted to talk about how my experience building Lanyard has convinced me that the default stack for building an interesting web application has changed dramatically over the past sort of four or five years. You know, it used to be that it was LAMP, Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP, and that was all you needed to build something. Today, there are a lot more moving parts involved if you want to build something interesting. And as I was putting together all of the things I wanted to talk about, I realized that each one of them was a conversation that I'd had with Matt Bidolf at some point over the last few years. Matt's um, built Doppler uh, using a lot of this stuff several years ago, and he's been an inspiration for a lot of the decisions we've made with Lanyard. And since he was here, I decided to invite him up on stage and turn this into more of a conversation about web technology stacks and startups in general. So I'm going to hand over to Matt, and we'll um, start talking about what we've, been, what we've been building with recently. Okay, so as, as, uh, as James says, there's so much we can learn from looking at what our active live startups do on the ground, and Lanyard is, is iterating incredibly on both their feature set and their technology stack. Um, but uh, Lanyard didn't, wasn't always a highly funded professional tech city startup. It had a, there's an origin story behind it. How did Lanyard come together, Simon, and how did, uh, how did the technology stack evolve with its unusual situation? So Lanyard is... Um it's a sort of classic example of a side project that grew into a startup. And the slightly unconventional origin story is that um, Natalie and I uh, started Lanyard, and uh, Natalie's there in the front row. We actually co-founded the, the company on our honeymoon. Um, we got married back in June of 2010. We quit our jobs and went traveling around the world for as long as we could. And three months in, we sort of got stuck in Casablanca, feeling a bit too ill to move on, and had this idea for a start, uh, well, for a, a project, and said, okay, well, we'll rent a flat for two weeks, we'll build the first version, we'll show it to some friends, and we'll, and we'll see what happens. So the very first version of Lanyard um, was a JSON file that I'd meticulously plucked together of informational conferences, and a few lines of Python that pulled a Twitter name and told you if that person was following anyone who was speaking at a conference. And we sort of evolved it a tiny bit from that. We put something live for our friends. It was running on one server. It was a bit of Python and a MySQL database, and that was pretty much it. And they said, hey, yeah, that's quite useful. You should throw it open to people. Of course, the problem was that we built Lanyard against Twitter. The idea is that you sign in with Twitter, we look at who you're following, and you, we show you events that those people are attending or speaking at. And when you launch something that deals with Twitter, it turns out Twitter's sort of viral. And um, we, hadn't really, we hadn't really accounted for that. We launched the site, and two hours later, our single server with the database and the application things on the same thing was, was falling apart. And we had to scrounge around and pull up another Linode box and, and try and get things working. So it was one of those, I wouldn't say it was an overnight success, but it grew way, way faster than you'd ever expect a side project to grow. And a lot of the technology decisions we've made have been on the basis of you start with the simplest thing that could possibly work, and then you, you sort of scale it up as and when it starts hurting. So there are, there are obviously, there's so many components in the modern web stack that we can get for free from, from the community for open source these days. Um, but there's a huge amount of choice out there. You know, are you going to use Solar or Elasticsearch or something else for your search engine? Uh, what database are you going to use? Um, what, are the, what are sort of the, the biggest wins, the, biggest, uh, the, the most sort of superpowers you've got? from using uh, open source software? What are your favorite pieces? So I love, that. I love that term, superpowers. I love this idea that if you pay attention to what's in your stack, to what components are out there, you can gain an enormous advantage over people who haven't figured this stuff out yet. So one of my absolute favorite examples is Redis, which has been mentioned already today. Um, it turned up, what, a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago? And it was about a thousand lines of C code that this guy in Sicily had written. And what Redis does is it exposes fundamental computer science data structures over a network interface. It's sort of a data structure server. So it's kind of like memcached in that you can store values in it and get them back out again. But it lets you work with higher level um, structures like sets or lists or queues. And it does it all in memory, and it does it incredibly fast. So once you've got something like Redis, it becomes certain operations that would have been really expensive with the database become so cheap they're practically free. My favorite example is we have a feature on Lanyard where you can go and look at a conference, and we'll show you all of the people who are attending that conference who you are also following on Twitter. And in Redis terms, that's a, that's a set intersection. We ask for the intersection of the set of people you follow and the set of people attending that conference, which Redis can do at a rate of 100,000 um, comparisons a second on my laptop. So on a, on a proper server, it runs even faster. 
And this means that this feature, which if we'd built against the database, would have had a significant performance impact. We'd have had to think about it. We didn't have to think about it at all. We could just roll it straight out. So if you, it, it seems like these days there's, um, there's so much choice out there, so many nice tools you could be incorporating into your stack that we don't even have to feel like, okay, what's my choice of database? Am I going MySQL? Am I going Postgres? Why, why have just one database when you can have three in your architecture? <laughs> and, I think you know, that's, that's all well and good until you're, you know, recompiling drivers for Ruby or something else, the latest iteration of MongoDB. How do you introduce something like Redis into a system without just rewriting all your MySQL code to use Redis instead? So the rule, we've, the rule we've worked by, which has worked really well for us, is we use a relational database. We're actually using Amazon's RDS, because when there's just one of you doing all of the sysadmin, it's nice to have Amazon deal with the MySQL config files for you. Um, so we have a relational database, and all of our core data lives in that, and it's properly normalized, and you know, it's, 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 it's a nicely designed schema. And then we denormalize things into other data stores. So the primary things we do are we denormalize some of our data into Redis, so anything where we might want to do a set intersection or pick a random item out of a list, we make sure that that's being updated into Redis as well. And we also denormalize our data into Solar, which is traditionally used as a full text search engine, but it's actually got some really powerful features. Um, facilities for doing other types of query, um, especially the kinds of query which databases might not deal with so well. So the benefit of doing that is that um, any normalization problems, any time you notice that there's a bug because the data here obviously isn't quite the same as the data over there, you've got your master in the database and you can just, re you can just repopulate the solar index or the Redis index or whatever straight from it. So it makes it a lot easier to manage all of those different um, denormalizations. So, um one of the things, one of the advantages uh, I think I had when we were when we were first building Doppler, um, I you know I had a lot of friends that I went to in the tech industry, and you you know you want to go go to people who've built who've been there for a few years, sort of sit on their knee and hear the hear the stories of what it was like in the olden days, and uh, you know pitfalls that you, you should avoid. Sat on Cal's knee. I sat on Cal Henderson's knee. Uh, just around the time he was writing scalable, uh, the, the Scalable Websites book, and he told me some of his secrets, uh, and not all of them were disgusting. But he, uh, he you know, and he, I, I learned from him, for example, some of the ways that Flickr uh, shards their database. But um, one of the things, one of the pitfalls definitely for a new startup or a new code base is, okay, I've, I've read the book, and I've seen how Flickr scales to millions and millions of users. Um, I've read all the stuff about how Twitter is using this or that database. Um, and then you rush with great, uh, great glee into using some system that, while it will scale up if you do it right, doesn't necessarily scale down. That something that when you're using it on one or two or ten machines rather than thousands, um, kind of it has its it has its hiccups at that level. So how how do you go about spotting a technology that you think you can deploy in the early stages of a startup that will uh, that will give you benefits later as well? So the number one rule I had with I, I've always had with evaluating technologies that I might want to use is I need to be able to download it and get it running and have it doing something useful within half an hour. And if it takes longer than half an hour. Unless it's a real pain point and I'm really going to need that thing, I tend to move on, especially when I'm sort of iterating again, when I'm working on startup stuff as opposed to just tinkering around. And that's, I found that filters out the good technologies pretty well. You know, things like Solar, Redis, MongoDB are all download, run a script, and start talking to it through a standard Python library or whatever. Um, it does mean that there have been some things like um, Puppet, for example, which we didn't start using at Lanyard until quite a bit after we should have been using it, just because every time I sat down and tried to get Puppet working, half an hour would pass and I'd still be trying to you know, figure out what was supposed to go on what machine. Um, and actually, the solution for Puppet, it turned out, was to hire Tom Insom, who, who used to work with Matt at Doppler. I've and, used that and, solution as well. Yes, and so, yeah, but nobody should hire Tom Insom. Um, <laughs> it's, 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 a it's a terrible idea. Um, but yeah, so, um, so, we, so that was, we did kind of save up a bunch of technical debt on the operations side of things and sort of cross our fingers and hope that the site didn't crash until, until we could find ourselves a, a Tom Inson to make sure everything was running okay. <laughs> so there's a, a, a quote that I've completely lost the origin from. If anyone knows who originally said this, I'd love to hear it because I've said it over and over again in different teams. Is like, I really believe that you shouldn't do 
uh, R&D on a live project, that if you're deploying something, you should have at least some faith in it, and you shouldn't just be picking on the latest fashionable technology or trying something out because it looks good. You need a bit of experience before you, because you're doing so much as a startup founder day to day, whether it's running your company or making product decisions or talking to investors and hopefully writing some code or building the product at some point. Um, you just haven't got the time that you have uh, normally to investigate every little uh, piece that you're going to use. So I found it's, uh, you know, over the two or three years, over the three or so years of, of building Doppler, a lot, of the co a lot of the systems I was incorporating, a lot of the choices uh, for what I was going to deploy came from my experience of the previous years. So, for example, we never, we only, uh, we, we never actually converted to using Git uh, because although it was uh, a fantastic system and I could see that it was going to be really powerful and useful, um, at that point, around, when was this, I guess, you know, 2006 to 2009, I didn't personally feel confident in it. I hadn't had time to play with it properly. Um, can you tell me a bit about your experience, uh, either during or, or, or running up to Lanyard, with bar camps, hack days, uh, tell us maybe a bit about the dev fort and how that in informed your uh, technology choices for Lanyard. So um, Lanyard, we would have not, have been, not have been able to build Lanyard the way we did if I hadn't spent the three previous years having an awful lot of fun doing side projects and I was working at the Guardian and doing some sort of experimental technology pieces there as, as well as sort of more, more traditional work and so I went into Lanyard with a whole sort of scope of technologies which I tried out on previous things and I knew were going to work. And some of those were still what you might consider relatively experimental. Things like Redis, I, I could use that at Lanyard because I previously used it, used it for a project at The Guardian where it had worked out really well. Um, I mean, that said, we've introduced new technologies into, the, into Lanyard, but we've been quite cautious with them. So we're now using MongoDB as an example, but because we'd never used it before, we've um, relegated it to logging for the moment. So for the first sort of few months of using Mongo, it was sat there accepting sort of error logs and other things like that. Stuff where if we lost it, it would be irritating, but it wouldn't be a complete fiasco. And now that Mongo has proved itself, we've started moving it into, into storing other, other bits of data as well. Um, so Matt mentioned dev forts. This is, um, this is a really fun thing that we did a few of in the past few years. Um, there's this idea of hack days or hack weekends where a bunch of people get together and they hack something together in 48 hours. Some friends of ours decided it would be fun to extend that to a full week. And to make it interesting, they hired a fortress. They hired a Napoleonic sea fort on Alderney in the Channel Islands. And we took a dozen people out there and we spent a week hacking a project together. And that, um, which, that project turned into a side project, a site called wildlifenearyou.com. Um, it was a great opportunity to experiment with a whole bunch of new technology um, ideas and things. Um, but it also, it's sort of the most creative environment you can imagine, because you're on a fortress. There's no internet connection because you're on a fortress. <laughs> So um, in, in, in the middle of the, in practically in the middle of the ocean. So you get to, you, so you have to take everything with you. You bring all of the Debian repositories that you can find and every package off Ruby Gems and all of that kind of stuff. And you just get a solid week to try things out and build stuff with a bunch of people who are sort of equally excitable and um, and technologically minded. And yeah, a lot of a lot of that sort of rapid prototyping, build something as fast as you can in a week. That was really useful in the first few months of of of, of, of building a startup. Okay, so as, as we move towards the end of our time, um, you said, you said uh, in your introduction that there's, there's a new web stack that even in the last two, three, uh, or, or perhaps five years, um, it's no longer just about, okay, I get my database and I put a app server in front of it and a web server in front of that, the traditional sort of three-tier web architecture. So what are all the things that you would deploy on day one of a new web stack and uh, how do so they fit together? So I think the, the, the crucial difference today is, firstly, it used to be that your, the biggest decision was which web framework were you going to use. Were you using PHP or Django or Rails or whatever? And that's still important, but much more important is the, the set of infrastructure that you build up around that. So one of the key examples is, um, is, is having some kind of message queue, or at the very least, some kind of offline worker process. With Lanyard, we're using a system called Celery, which is something that's very popular in the Python community. And it's a way of coordinate, uh, very simply firing off a piece of work into, onto a queue, which gets done by a background worker. And once that work is finished, it sticks the result in memcached so you can find it. And it's a bit of a fiddle to set up, but once you've got that, 
all sorts of things become super easy. Anything where you might be talking to an external API, which could take several seconds to return, or there's some kind of image processing job going on. You write a couple of lines of, lines of code, plug it into the message queue, and you've got that running in a way that's not going to hang your server if hundreds of people try it out all at once. So I think getting a message queue and, and a set of workers up and running on day one is, is absolutely critical. I'm a huge fan as well of having some kind of full text search engine that's separate from the database running. I've used Solar very successfully in a bunch of projects. Um, Elasticsearch is something we're, we've experimented again, again with a sort of non-critical component, and it, it looks like it's getting to the point where it'd be a really good idea to deploy. But having that from day one and having the systems by which your database, um, the stuff in your database is being sensibly pushed into a search engine means that, again, all sorts of problems, which would have been enormous problems, suddenly become just you know, recycling a little bit of search code and, and, and knocking together something pretty quickly. And then the other one is Redis, which I think is in a category all of its own. You know, it's, it's not a cache. It's a, it's a data structure server. I suppose the only real alternative is if you're running something, if you're running on a Java stack and you just have a bunch of long running processes with, with locks and semaphores and stuff on data structures. But with Redis, you don't need to have to think about any of that. It's got a very simple client API. Any of your systems can talk to it. And it's so screamingly fast that stuff which you would have had to think about as having potential performance impact just doesn't have any impact at all. But I, so, you know, if you've got your application server, you've got your cache, you've got your message queue, you've got your full text index of some sort, maybe something like Varnish on the front end for speeding things up. I think that's a really good basis for a web stack which will let you innovate faster than people who haven't got all of those components in place. And really, for a startup, it turns out the technology isn't the challenge. The challenge is figuring out the right kind of features and you know, quickly trying things out, seeing what, what, what sticks with users and what doesn't. And any technology advantage that you can find that means that you can iterate faster is something that's worth having. So, um, as, as James says, Simon is, is absolutely one of the most pragmatic and uh, quick-footed developers that any of us know. So keep your eye on him, and if you see him make a technology choice, then it's, that's certainly the next thing to be investigating. So join me in thanking Simon Willison. Oh. Thank you, Matt.